Hello everyone and welcome. Good evening if you're joining us from Asia. Good morning and good afternoon if you're joining us from other parts of the world. My name is Deep Pal and I'm a visiting fellow in the Asia program in Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And we are here today for a very special launch event for the paper, China's Influence in South Asia, Vulnerabilities and Resilience in Four Countries. It is part of a Carnegie Endowment project, China's impact on strategic regions, in which we look at eight pivotal countries, four in South Asia and four in Europe, and how China's expanding footprint has influenced them. More on the project in just a minute, but before that, a little bit about the panelists who are joining us today. We have a stellar panel. And let me welcome first Asanga Abhaygunasekhara, who is an international security and geopolitics analyst and a senior fellow at Millennium Project in Washington, D.C. He's a prolific author, most recently of a Conundrum of an Island, Sri Lanka's Geopolitical Challenges, which came out earlier this year. He's a regular commentator in various publications on South Asian security. He is also the founding director general of the Institute of National Security and Strategic Studies in Sri Lanka. Welcome, Asanga. Next, we have Dr. Masroor Riaz, who is an economist and the founder and chairman of Policy Exchange Bangladesh, which focuses on applied economic policy and investment. He has worked at the World Bank and at United Kingdom's Department of International Development, or DFID, and he's an expert on economic growth and creation of markets. Welcome, Masroor. We also have Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, who is presently a research director at the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. He has held visiting and regular faculty positions at different universities in Nepal and China. His most recent book, Nepal and the Great Powers, came out in 2019. And very few people that I know keep as close an eye on Nepal's relationships with other powers as Pramod does. Thank you for joining us today, Pramod. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Rashida Didi, a member of the Maldives Higher Education Council. She also works as an independent academic and resource person and has been associated with the Maldives National University for many years. She is one of the preeminent voices on international relations out of Maldives. And in recent years, uh, she has been focusing on the Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific issues, particularly relating to the Maldives. I welcome you all. Uh, before we get started, a few uh, house rules for uh, those who are uh, those who are joining us over Zoom, YouTube, or any other social media channel. Uh, you can also watch us on uh, any of Carnegie Endowment's many social media pages. Wherever you are, if you have a question, please mention who your question is to. Leave it in the comment box of the service you're using, and we will pick it up from there. Now, before we go ahead a little bit about this project, China's impact... Uh, of, on strategic regions, uh, uh, that is the project, it fulfills the need for a grassroots view of Chinese engagement in South Asia and in parts of Europe. Now, in the last decade, we know China has become far more attentive to its South Asian periphery. It has moved beyond mere commercial and development engagements to more far-reaching political and security ones. Now, this includes having a say in uh, domestic political developments and emerging as an active stakeholder in people-to-people -people relations and even stepping, stepping in to influence how China is portrayed in the media in these countries. Now, our project comes in here to provide an understanding of Chinese influence in South Asia that is based on local ground zero perspective, which we felt was uh, not there as much as one would have needed to. Now, we set out to connect a network in, of influencers. We got their views on how they feel about China's relationship with their countries. We used interviews, we trawled the local uh, newspapers in the local languages in all of these four focus countries, as well as in English. But the purpose was to understand the issues from the local stakeholders who have deep knowledge that would help devise better and accurate uh, understanding of the issues and therefore inform the recommendations in the paper. Now, one of the key findings of the project has been that in many of these countries, China's economic and political footprint has expanded so quickly that even those countries that have relatively strong state and civil society institutions were struggling to grapple with the implications. As part of this project, we therefore identified and categorized the vulnerabilities in these focus states in South Asia. In some countries, we found that state institutions were brittle. In some cases, the civil society acted as an inadequate check against creeping external interference. Elsewhere, we found elites were prone to capture, including by external actors such as China and its proxies. Now, 
I will briefly get into the findings, uh, but we will talk a great deal more about that with our panelists. But we, what we found is that while China's interest is strategic, its main asset are its economic levers of influence. And this depends on what these four states want or ask for. Now, China is proactive in using its tools of influence, which are becoming more and more diverse with increasing time as well as greater engagement. We also found that current, current, the countries are learning from each other and changing how they exercise their agency as a result. In terms of recommendations, we found that for a country such as the US or its partners uh, to be engaged in South Asia, one of the key things is to be consistent. Now, that is a strategy that China has used and has used with great success. For the United States to be present in South Asia would require a solid, consistent policy with uh, objectives that were clear to the participating countries. Uh, let me also tell you that while we have the English copy of the paper, which is already in the Carnegie Endowment website, we are already translating this in uh, Sinhala, Nepali, and Bangla. Now, the Sinhala paper will be available later today on the Carnegie Endowment website. You can pick it up from there. The Bangla and Nepali translations will be available on the Carnegie Endowment website by the end of this week, by Friday. And we hope that these translations allow us to reach more people in these countries and allow informed debate. With that, let me uh, start by uh, welcoming the panelists. And Masrur, if I can start with you, I hope you have had a chance to go through the report. And I was wondering, what is driving the Bangladesh-China relationship? And, and in terms of what we found in the report, are, are these largely the ways in which the dynamics of this relationship is, is working, or is there more? Uh, thank you, Deep. Uh, First of all, uh, let me congratulate you, your team, and the Carnegie Endowment for completing uh, this seminal piece of work and very timely. And uh, I think uh, this is going to be extremely helpful in both geopolitics as well as geoeconomics in terms of uh, sort of, uh, you know, the lights it, uh, it you know, it, it provides in, in terms of the uh, current reality, the direction, and uh, what it means or implications for uh, countries like Bangladesh or South Asia as a region, as a whole. Uh, and thank you for having me over here. And uh, I also congratulate you and the team to, in our, you know, as you have, uh, you know, brought out really concrete findings, very uh, focused uh, direction in terms of uh, your assessment in the report. So I think uh, what drives the Bangladesh-China relationship? I would say uh, three there are many areas, but I would categorize them into three uh, groups. Uh, broader broader uh, geopolitics, uh, economic, and developmental. And uh, although economic and developmental sound uh, often may sound similar, but there are sort of fine line between the two as well. And often the, the two, the economic and developmental, is, is uh, intrinsically linked to the broader geopolitical uh, aspects. Now, the, as we all know, the Bangladesh-China relationship uh, started back in 70s, and I think it evolved through the decades uh, whereby the two countries became quite close in terms of, uh, uh, you know, particularly the Chinese investment, uh, grad which gradually increased over the, over the time uh, into uh, infrastructure areas, right? Uh, and this Chinese infrastructure involvement started very intensely in the 90s and then started expanding in the 2000s. And in the last decade, uh, particularly in the last few years, it has reached a, a very, uh, uh, you know, sort of intense uh, state. So uh, this, this, uh, this whole infrastructure development, which is China's mainstay in contribution to Bangladesh's development, I think it's very well appreciated as Bangladesh required uh, huge infrastructure development at the at the you know it uh, particularly as it was taking off the economy was taking off towards the middle income about 10 15 years ago and the country was actually making good progress at the at a level where uh, most LDCs actually uh, found it difficult to reach that level. Uh, you know, for, for one, for one, you know, Bangladesh has had the highest share of manufactured goods in its exports 
uh, compared to any other LDCs, you know, less development, less developed countries. Bangladesh's share of manufactured merchandise or merchandise in export has been almost 90 percent, and the average LDC has been 20, 25 percent. Now, banking on that, Bangladesh really wanted to make it to break, you know, break into it. One, it wanted to break into the middle income status, which it finally did in 2016, 2017. And it wanted to break out of the LDC category into the developing country status, for which it finally qualified uh, first in 2018 and the final assessment in 2021. So all of these uh, also came on the on the sort of uh, back of uh, the very important need for Bangladesh to continually create two million plus jobs every year for the youths who were coming into the into the job market. And this was really important both for uh, the politicians as well as for you know, the social order and social progress. And that in turn required this huge investment or Bangladesh to upgrade itself towards, uh, you know, the next set of infrastructure development for which it required external finance. Of course, it did have a very strong participation of the development partners, such as the World Bank Group, Asian Development Bank, Japan, but it needed more. And I think uh, where it uh, actually made it uh, sort of really easier for China to come into that developmental aspect is where you know all other development partners kind of stopped either in terms of availability of funding or the speed of disbursement or in terms of risk threshold environmental social and other or even procurement risk the Chinese came in and actually pushed the envelope and that's where I think the Bang Chinese Bangladesh's relationship with China through the expansion of our upgradation of the infrastructure development through the sort of infrastructure 2.0 i think it it took bangladesh china relationship to a next you know sort of next level the second was the economic part uh, as you know the bangladesh is in it's it, it made huge uh, uh, sort of uh, achievements in terms of economic prosperity 6% plus growth rate consistent over a decade uh, increase in income increase in wages uh, for two consecutive years, IMF has uh, sort of uh, put Bangladesh ahead of India in terms of GDP per capita. And, and a cornerstone of that was actually uh, um, export-led manufacturing, ready-made garments, but then ready-made garments and uh, also had a few other uh, sort of uh, members in its export club, leather and footwear, uh, food, uh, frozen foods and several other sectors. But on the bank, uh, sort of, uh, you know, banking on this export-oriented sector, huge domestic market also expanded, which also got uh, fueled by, you know, an increasing number of remittances or volume of remittances from countries where Bangladeshi migrant workers have been sending money, but also the growth of agri-supply chain and its impact on rural economy. But Bangladesh, being a resource-constrained country, uh, it hugely depended on the smooth supply chain, a competitive supply chain, uh, a, and, and access to inputs in the right time at the right price in order for Bangladesh to be competitive in the global market, to, to become the second largest exporter of ready-made garments, and thereby uh, claiming a sort of a very strong position in the exporters club. And China you know, steadily remained as the largest supplier of uh, inputs into the industrial sector, both for export and domestic market, as well as in the agri sector in the country. So, you know, that is an example of how the economic drivers deepen the relationship. So if we're talking to the private sector, I think whether it's in terms of machineries or inputs or raw materials, or often in terms of human resources these days, technical resources, I think China comes up very, uh, uh, you know, frequently. And then of course the overall geopolitical uh, drivers, particularly starting from 2017 when the Rohingya crisis happened in Myanmar, I think that basically brought Bangladesh and China even closer because, uh, you know, Bangladesh had to accept. And it was a reality that, you know, China has a strong liver on Myanmar and its, uh, you know, military junta or Myanmar as a country. And Bangladesh really needed a lot of assurance and uh, it really needed to find out ways how to, in, in terms of how to address this sort of unfolding Rohingya crisis. And that's where I think the Chinese uh, sort of uh, offer or the extension of help is something Bangladesh, you know, uh, embraced as right. something very warm. And, 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 and mm. that, that kind of uh, underpins the third pillar of Bangladesh-China relationship, the geopolitics.
Over to you, Dean. Right, right. Thanks, Masrur. Masrur, I'll come back to you. But Asanga, if you can come to you, you know, one of the things that uh, are at the center, possibly, of what Masrur is saying is 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 essentially China has looked at Bangladesh and figured out what what Bangladesh needs, right, or what Bangladesh is asking for, and customized its approach. Is that something that uh, you would say you've seen in Sri Lanka's case as well? Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, Deep. Um, I think uh, let me congratulate Carnegie and uh, the, the team for doing this and a uh, very important and valuable uh, report. Uh, it's an eye opener, actually, uh, some of the recommendations when I read uh, not only for Sri Lankan, uh, uh, the policy circle, but also even for the DC, uh, Washington DC policy circle. Uh, for the last few months I've been here, um, I mean, the, the rhetoric that I hear is a China invasion. Uh, the, the more sort of um, the public discourse of a China invasion. So uh, the report actually uh, brings uh, different contours into the Chinese influence um, in uh, countries like Sri Lanka and how we could uh, reverse China's belligerent behavior uh, with the challenging as well as what it requires, the diplomatic, the finesse, the commercial innovation, and also the institutional creativity uh, in many South Asian countries is required right now. The recent uh, fertilizer in incident, uh, the imports of fertilizer from China is a very clear uh, example in this. So the report actually captures uh, these areas. So I haven't seen um, many reports in this direction only focus on the infrastructure or the, the debt trap, but the, it goes beyond that. And uh, rightly identifying a high risk um, of uh, influencing uh, political parties, uh, journalists, various other uh, stakeholders in the, uh, uh, in the country. Uh, the, the impact to the democratic quintessence, um, which has been followed by uh, countries like Sri Lanka. Uh, it's true that Sri Lanka has been quoted on the debt trap um, you know, multiple times in the international uh, articles and many other, but it has not seen uh, how we could reverse uh, certain trends uh, in Sri Lanka. How do we sort of uh, introduce standards uh, into the infrastructure? Uh, if the uh, infrastructure projects are transformative, then they, it's fine. Deep. I mean, there, there is no problem. Uh, what, what sort of... Um, requirement what 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 does the technical expertise does the policy uh bureaucrats need what do, what do they need um, i mean us does to speak about you know strengthening alliances it spokes uh, in its hub and spokes or multiple alliances they, i mean with the AUKUS and the quad and all that is going on of course um it's important to focus on what sort of technical assistance uh, required um, and on the supply chains, uh, like uh, my previous uh, speaker rightly mentioned, I mean, Sri Lanka, um, as a developing nation, we need uh, China, China's, uh, you know, assistance. We need China's supply chains. You cannot disrupt these things. So you, you have to continue. But how do we uh, engage with China, cooperate with China, rather than, you know, having, um, getting into conflicts? Uh, so it, it, the report gives that space to look at. And uh, so that's a huge, uh, I would say, I congratulate on that particular area that you have really focused on. Um, so I think the, uh, the, the heavy militarization, uh, you know, uh, discussed by the UNHRC, as well as China's support on the human rights. So those are areas also to look at uh, because the, the democratic uh, fabric or the, the, the in China's influence uh, to the internal politics are serious concerns that the policy uh, policymakers in Sri Lanka needs to uh, clearly look at. Um, so when it comes to uh, projects such as the port city, which has been widely discussed, um, so these things I mean are done in a 30-day approval process, and so it, it would have taken a bit longer. I would have taken more uh, perspectives in. Um, so I think um, it's really really important to uh, to look at um, uh, China. Uh, and its behavior. I mean, Sri Lanka has been, a, um, I mean, a clear point of uh, where Chinese submarines have visited. Chinese influence have been seen um, a serious threat to India. Uh, it's, um, you know, South Asia's larger um, uh, power. So 
it's really, really important uh, that to see uh, China in different contours, uh, how do we sort of strengthen the relationship with diplomatic, uh, like I mentioned, the finesse uh, that is required, uh, the balanced foreign policy that is important for Sri Lanka to take forward, rather than you know choosing a bandwagoning uh, policy just because of the loans that we have received, uh, just because of the vaccine diplomacy. Uh, importance of the balance is uh, it, it impacts the regional security uh, stability also. Uh, I mean, uh, small nations uh, like, I mean, literals in the Indian Ocean, uh, I would say, are really, really important in this uh, in the Pacific, um, uh, the uh, the grand strategy, which is uh, been uh, been executed right now. So while the B while Sri Lanka nations like Sri Lanka are sort of sandwiched between the BRI and the Indo Pacific, we we need to look at bringing in standards, uh, bringing in techniques, uh, innovative techniques to our commercial. Um, you know, dealings with China and uh, transparency. That's really, really important. Right. Thanks for that, Asanga. Pramod, if I can come to you, you know, the question of uh, Nepal is, is a slightly different one, as we also mention in the report. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of it is, is uh, the changing strategic importance of Nepal, as well as the role of geography, right? And I'm curious, in what ways do you see that having influenced the Nepal-China relationship in recent years? Uh, thank you, Deep. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for a wonderful report. I really learned a lot. A uh, little before coming to that, let me briefly uh, highlight how Nepal and China engage. Uh, actually, uh, if you go through Nepal and China relations, what you can observe is that Nepal and Nepalese political parties have often blamed of has been blamed of being closer to China. But to be very frank, Nepal has always established closer ties with India, not China. But only when the ruling regime uh, were not supported by India, uh, it has moved towards China. For example, if you go to King Mahendra, uh, King Mahendra uh, at the time in 1962, uh, there was a democratic forces in Nepal and India was supporting that. And that was the time where uh, King Mahendra went to China and asked for support. It was the same during King Brenda time. Again, there was a new uh, introduction of democracy and democratic forces supported by India. Then came King Ganendra. At that time also, India did not support the monarch. When you come to Maoist party or the Olin, they only went to China where they were not supported by India. So though many times Nepal has been accused of being very close to China, the ruling regime has only moved to China when they are not supported by India. So they have. Uh, so that is we have to be very clear that uh, China has also realized that that the ruling regime come to them only when they are, they do not enjoy good relations with India or when they have difficult times. That is why China has not shown much excitement or enthusiasm when these parties went to China. For example, 1962 or others. Uh, but. Coming to that, uh, it's not that China did not exploit that opportunities. Uh, even when uh, in China was not very enthusiastic, China used that opportunity. If you look at the history, there are three major periods where China had a strong engagement in Nepal, and that has shaped the overall relations. First was 1962. Uh, in 1962, immediately after the Indochina War, you know, China ended the Himalayan barrier by constructing Kodari Pass with Nepal. And we can take it in economic terms that in 1962, the economic engagement with Nepal started. Coming to uh, 2005, when there was King Ganda period and the Maoist uh, uh, came after uh, a while, I think that was the time where China started engaging with Nepal on a strategic front. There are lots of high level visit by the officials from defense sector, defense ministers. So since then, the flow of assistance in security sector started. That I, I, I call it a second term. And third is the recent one, KP Wallis tenure, where there is party to party relations that is started. So first was economics, second is strategic, and third is party to party relations. So these are the major development in the relations between two countries, which has shaped the relations. Uh, if you look at China's engagement around the world, China engages at four levels. First, China starts its, its engagement with trade. 
And when trade flourishes, it goes to investment, when they are secure, when they believe that investment can be secure. After China invests in that country, they go for defense cooperation. And when they see that things, is, and if you look around the world, there are few countries with which China has been able to establish that defense cooperation. And at the end, they go for political advice. And in Nepal, China have reached that final lap, which is the fourth stage. Uh, there are a few things that I want to highlight on the report. Like I really enjoy the report. It is very comprehensive and it has touched on all the major aspects. At the same time, the author has looked at China in a holistic manner, which I really appreciate. There are a few things that I really want to highlight, three things basically. In the report, that author has pointed that Chinese tools of influence are China's personal relation with key regime actors, form of incentives or threat. They, China uses data or compel both state and non-state actors. Sometimes China uses coercive threat, self censor many others. I think it is presented in a manner as if it's only China who has that capacity or only China uses those means. I'm a student of diplomacy and I teach to our students that uh, that in diplomacy there are different tools to promote national interest, diplomacy, propaganda, alliance, economic aid, loans, as well as coercive, manners, um, coercive measures. So basically what I want to say is that it is not only China who uses that tool or only China has the privilege or capacity. Every power does that. So China is not standing alone or it's not China is doing uh, amazing thing or it's not that China only has that capacity and other power do not. Second is that uh, the author has raised that connectivity and infrastructure project are the top of the wish list of all South East states and has become a key area of cooperation with China, which I fully agree that every country in South Asia engages with China, not for building party to party relations or importing democracy. Everyone wants connectivity, development, infrastructure projects. All the countries want that. There is only one factor that pulls uh, uh, all the countries towards China is the economy. And it's not only the small neighbors, it's even the United States, Japan, or Korea, or, or Australia. All the countries which do not enjoy relations with China are the ones who are the having biggest economic engagement. So it's not only small neighbors like Sri Lanka and Nepal who get attracted towards China for connectivity or infrastructure. Even big powers like US, European Union, Japan, Korea, or Australia get attracted towards China for economic gains. So that is the reason that uh, countries which do not have capacity, especially the small countries who don't have strong institutions, democratization is not so strong, they get vulnerable, that is true, but they are they both great power or small countries get distracted with China for the same reason. Uh, second thing, like on the Belt and Road, I think I agree with the author where he mentioned about that uh, the countries are coming with Build Back Better World initiatives. And I think the future of BR also depend on much. How better Build Back Better World is going to build the world. So that is the future of uh, BRI is going to, going to determine if America or the other powers are coming to come and build a beautiful, better world together. I think BRI will not be effective, will not be more efficient. But if they fail to, uh, that is uh, where Chinese can or BRI can benefit from. Uh, lastly, uh, like the author has also emphasized that communi communicating a positive agenda, not just a negative one, will bring win -win, uh, greater favor among government business public and i think it's true uh, because when the countries ask cont small powers to choose between a or b or china or the rest it shows a kind of lack of confidence among those power if india or us or any power come and ask nepal sri lanka small neighbors either choose india or america uh, sorry china or us i think this do not give a very good picture about them. It shows that, oh, the power is declining, or it shows China fear, uh, which shows that the US is not confident. And I think that is not the real situation. The situation is not that the country really have to worry about China if they are able to have a new policy, reform policy, but they present in such a way that it really scares small neighbors and then they are more in trouble. They feel, oh, it's, it's even the US who is not so confident. How can we take sides? So I think US and all has to be confident because they have so many allies. China has very few allies, Pakistan, Iran, North Korea, Russia, but the US has around the world. I think they can come together. So they should not come with the options that okay, choose between one or other. 
none of the small powers want to be in that situation where they have to choose between uh, US or China or any of the power and China. Uh, similarly, military ties and security in Nepal, there's one factor that I could not explain, uh, understand, maybe uh, uh, one of can explain that. It says that military ties and security in exchanges with Nepal has been among China's weakest in the region. What does it mean? I would not sure. Uh, now, let me come briefly like, uh, uh, there is one thing that it has also said that Nepal is on the high risk. Uh, I think maybe it was true till July, but now we have new government, which is led by Sir Bahadur Deva, which is from the Nepali Congress. So I think maybe we are moving towards medium. So I think we will not remain on high risk, we will be moving towards medium uh, in, in days to come. Uh, second is that the other reason that supports is that Nepal is a strong civil society. So uh, though we can have party to party relations, though can, the influence of China can increase, still the civil society and vibrant media will not allow the Nepalese democracy to fall apart. Uh, and the reason is that uh, we, get, we have seen that China have tried several times to keep Nepal Communist Party united, but they failed in spite of several attempts. It does not mean that China will get discouraged and go back. It will continue, but, but it shows how strong Nepal is when it comes to democratization process. A uh, few takeaway, I think, like, uh, uh, I think what Prabhu, we can do is that what Prabhu, we have realized, Prabhu, yeah, why just, don't I come back? Why don't I come back to you? Because there are a lot of questions that are coming in and I want sure. to be able to take them as well. And there are uh, questions that are being directed to, to Asanga and to you as well. But before I come to those, I want to quickly come to uh, Rashida and, and kind of try and understand uh, the, the, the Maldives-China relationship in the sense that, you know, how, how structural is, is Chinese presence in Maldives? Because of the four countries, it is among the newest ones. And we have seen a change between uh, the, the Maldives China relationship with the uh, Yamin regime and then in the Soli regime. So your thoughts on how, how, how structurally sound is the, is the relationship? Um, the, uh, the relationship is very clearly uh, politically oriented. Now, um, during the previous administration of President Yamin Abdul Qayyum, um, that's when China really became involved in the Maldives uh, to, to the extent that it was involved in the recent years. Um, so it had many diversities, as you mentioned in the report, um, diverse from many, many different types of projects. For example, uh, they started with cultural um, culturally oriented uh, projects like building the museum, um, establishing a small library or archives in within the national library, um, and then of course infrastructure, government infrastructure, building of the foreign ministry, former foreign ministry, um, and even now they got renovated, newly built again with China China's help. And then it was later in the 20, in the 2013 when I think it was in the yes in 2013 between 2013 and 18 during Yamin's government that it started um, on a mass scale the housing projects the infrastructure of housing projects. So that was the establishment. So I would say it's really politically oriented. And during the present government, we don't see China being involved that much because the present government is very much uh, pro China, uh, pro India. So uh, unfortunately, with the Maldives, one has to speak about India if one is speaking about China. Um, so that's the difference. It's it's between the two major powers that Maldivian government gets involved in. Um, then I think also an attraction is that the Chinese have a way of a more lenient way of helping financially. For example, it does not require heavy um, close monitoring of the project projects by the donor countries or don a donor um, institutions. For example, the famous or the world 
um, the, the, the most powerful financial institutions like the IMF and World Bank require strict, strict monitoring uh, rules. They have regulations. And India has also very strict, for example, employing their um, workers as um, people on the site and engineers and so on. So I think the China, uh, the, the Chinese attraction is for government, especially if the government is more prone to be more corrupt, it is very attractive. There's not that much of monitoring of where the finances are going so much. There's not that much of monitoring of how the project is progressing. So that's, uh, that's another attraction. And um, that's why I would say that the Maldives relationship with China is more financial, uh, more finance oriented than um, a politically oriented. As you mentioned in the reports that it does, it does have connections with um, the politics, for example, gaining popularity. Now, the biggest uh, project that Maldivians talk about is the Sino-Maldivian uh, Sino friendship bridge between the capital Male and the airport island. Now, that one um, was done during Yamin's government, which was becoming very unpopular with the common people. But that provided, that almost, I would say, lifted the government from that unpopularity, almost falling apart uh, situation, because it became a symbol of helping the people, serving the people, uh, connecting um, the capital to the airport. So, um, so people can go to the airport, especially if people are sick and taken, which are often done because the Maldives uh, does not have a, a very, it does have uh, hospitals, but it's not uh, providing for everybody, every patient's needs. So in that case, um, transportation, transportation is very, very important um, between the capital and the and the airport. Um, so that saved the that particular government administration. <clears throat> so coming back to your question again, um, another attraction I would say would be the tourist attraction. Now that's a major industry, as you know, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in the Maldives. China, China became the largest tourist group for about five years it had been. It surpassed the um, European tourists. So during that time, until, the, until 2019, from about five years before that, um, that was a major uh, strength for the relationship. For the Chinese, they found a little island um, nation where they can hop in and enjoy the beach. And for the Maldivians, they found a new market. Although, to be honest, Maldivians prefer the um, uh, European tourists because they, they spend more, obviously. I mean, they spend more on their entertainment and all kinds of and food and so on. Um, so back to you, if that answers your question. It kind of does, but if I can push you a little bit on that, Rashida, you know, I mean, elections in Maldives will come up in, in a couple of years, in mm. 2023 mm. and then 2024, right? From what you are saying, if there is a change in the government, does that, that how, how does that affect uh, 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 the China-Maldives relationship? And Asanga, I will come to you next with a similar question, considering the role, as we have read in the report as well, uh, between the elites in the country and, and China are crucial. So, Rashid, the first to you with that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, I, I didn't congratulate you on your work, which I really appreciated. I went through the report and it's, it's, very, it's very, very useful uh, for all of us, all the countries. Um, yes, how does that work? How, um, how that works is that if the, during 2023, we will have the election, depending on uh, the, um, the winner, 
and its politics, which could be either, you know, the current government or current coalition partners or parts of those partners, um, which would stand with India. But if it is the former government, Yamin's government, or people associated with that particular um, coalition, it could be China. Um, but right now, China's relationship with the Maldives is still very cordial. It's very good. Recently, um, just today, I heard that China um, offered scholarships, and one of the scholarships is for a, a swimmer, inter um, local swimmer, who is, a, who is a national champion, and also in the region, she's well known. So she, she got a scholarship. She, China offered scholarship to study in China. And it could be anything that she wants to study. But um, so it, these are new things happening. And the point is that China has not abandoned the Maldives. Neither the Maldives have abandoned China. Because it's very quickly that Maldives might have to turn to China, depending on, again, those strict rules that apply for financial uh, loans, etc. Um, Any time we, the government could could have to turn to um, China, so they have not offended China, and China neither is China offended with uh, or is threatening, as uh, I think parts of your report mentions. In some countries, it could be a threat. No, it has. Uh, China has not threatened the Maldives in any way, despite the fact that with the change of government, it. Um, uh, treated them very distantly and uh, very uh, with a very hostile attitude. Thank you. Asan, the same question to you. You know, the report in the report we talk about uh, the close relationship between uh, the the Rajapaksa regime and and China, and we had seen this uh, reverse a little bit under the earlier Sirisena uh, uh, Vikramasinghe uh, government. Right. Uh, what happens if the if the uh, if if, if uh, in the next elections uh, the Rajapaksas lose and others come back? Well, um, in the Sri Lankan story, uh, with my experience, uh, I mean, being in the government for fifteen years, serving the Rajapaksas uh, earlier regime one point zero, as well as the Sirisena regime. Um, the, the danger, uh, I mean, which you also have captured the the elites, uh, the China's involvement, influencing, uh, which you actually uh, call it high risk. Um, I would also put it as a serious uh, risk. Uh, looking at the um, uh, you know the dimensions uh, coming from the bureaucracy as well as the administration on China's influence uh, coming into uh, Sri Lankan um, you know the elites. Uh, such as the Gotabe Rajapaksa regime, which has opened um, a very sort of a different model to the Mahindas uh, uh, administration. Uh, his model is I mean, appointing 26 military officers, uh, getting military into the uh, democratic space or the political space. Uh, there's a huge danger for countries like Sri Lanka. Um, the volatility uh, of Sri Lanka is clearly understood because of the civil war it had, two youth insurrections, uh, constitutional coups, various other stuff. Uh, so a country that is open doors for military to come in, uh, take in government administration positions, um, which uh, China has no problem with that. Um, so here's the danger uh, which you have highlighted and which I don't want uh, China to get involved at all. China is a good partner in terms of economic. Uh, we assisted uh, Sri Lanka many, many times. Um, let it be there. So um, not come into the, uh, the come into the democratic space. Talking about uh, you know getting Sri Lanka to speak about Xinjiang uh, is is not a, a good way to go forward. I mean Sri Lanka has never spoken about uh, Chinese human rights in Xinjiang. Um, I mean, uh, I think our researchers have rightly captured that Sri Lanka uh, should not take, uh, become or take the part of Myanmar or go and get into, uh, you know, bringing the military as a self, as the final resort. Mahinda Rajapaksa during his regime uh, did not get the uh, military into administrative positions or administration. Now, this is a clear uh, 
uh, you know, basically the difference between the two brothers, although the two brothers are ruling the country together. Mahinda is a person uh, who has a much wider uh, political uh, dimension uh, coming from his experience of 40 years, uh, who can actually, you know, bring back some sort of balance um, into the regime uh, right now. So um, I don't see that because uh, we had multiple elections, so things need to, consistent policies need to continue, uh, such as the recommendations of your, even your, uh, you know, the report. Uh, we need consistent uh, policies to move forward. A country like Sri Lanka, as we are struggling with the economic crisis right now, uh, with the COVID, as well as multiple issues um, and challenges. So important that we see the Chinese perspective also. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, seeing let's talk about the, the you know, when you talk about the adventurism uh, or the aggressiveness of uh, China. The Chinese officers used to say, like, you know, shall we talk about the U.S. adventurism? Um, they are very blunt in their statements. So uh, even on the uh, submarine visit, they used to tell me, don't worry about it. They're not even nuclear. This was quote unquote, I mean, from the Chinese. Uh, so the perspective from China is also really important uh, to capture. While uh, China should not get involved in the, uh, uh, the internal politics of Sri Lanka, uh, and also Sri Lankan policymakers should make sure there should be proper standards uh, like promote, uh, rightly mentioned, uh, Biden's uh, B3W, if he, if he can implement these things uh, on bringing standards. Uh, Sri Lanka has always been a partner on the international, uh, I mean, adhering to the international norms and laws of the law of the sea or the, the Indo, uh, Indian Ocean Zone for peace. Uh, tremendous, uh, you know, you can see from the past uh, its contribution. So you should move forward in that direction. Uh, when you see... Uh, uh, support coming to a semi-autocratic or moving, uh, pushing a quasi-democracy to a semi-autocracy. So you, this is the danger. Your report captures that uh, the agency, the the Chinese coming into. Uh, so because you cannot, for example, I mean, uh, approve such a massive project like Port City in 30 days. Uh, so there you go. So that that clearly shows the China involvement in. Um, in these uh, areas, I mean, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar, when he was in Colombo, was uh, I mean, he was he was straightforward. He, he did ask uh, on the East Container Terminal of the Chinese hand. I mean, is there? I mean, of course, um, you know, when the, when does the port workers speak about geopolitics? Port port uh, authority. I mean, the trade unions does not speak geopolitics. Uh, so you have to understand the dimensions, the complexity. But China should uh, is a, is a, is a, is is a old civilization we have interacted with uh, China. Multi, I mean, from its uh, from the past, it's important that we have a strengthen our relationship with China also. But China should not get into uh, uh, internal politics and um, you know uh, coming into alter a model or come up with a, a Chinese uh, model of development. But let, let Sri Lanka choose his own model of development. Okay, uh, Asanga, you talked about, you know, the, the, the question of Xinjiang, right? And we have a question uh, from Susan Finder of Peking University, and it's, it's to all uh, panelists. Uh, if the panelists could comment on the role of the rule of law in their relationship with China, uh, who would like to go first? Pramod, would you want to start? Uh, let me add a couple of points and then come to rule of law. Actually, like uh, there's a few questions as well which has been raised. Like uh, I think the purpose of China is and other countries around the world is same that China wants to serve its national interest. It is true that they uses illegitimate ways or illegitimate, illegitimate means. Like it is true that China benefits through weak institutions, weak state institutions. Uh, China don't believe in rule of law. Uh, we all know that. China uh, want to get benefit of fragile civil societies. Uh, similarly, countries where elite captures a feature of political system. These are the uh, features that China benefits from that. Uh, China is not interested in rule of law. We all know that because China is just interested to get its in, uh, interest fulfilled. But the problem is that in spite of countries coming around in the region and spending such a huge amount of resources, 
where do they come from? What the countries in South Asia are asking is that the other countries should enable this country to have strong institutions, a strong institution that can uh, ensure rule of law. Uh, for, uh, the, the civil society should be strengthened. That is what the countries are asking for. Um, that is what Nepal says, that if China, America or the other countries can benefit from China economically, why can't Nepal benefit? Then the question is yes, because ne America has strong institutions, they have rule of law, they have uh, they have a uh, strong civil society. And that is what Nepal asked for. Why not ne United States help us in building those uh, uh, institutions? Uh, help us in democratization that will uh, deter China to use those illegitimate means. That is what we want. We want Chinese assistance or economic support. At the same time, we want Western support to strengthen our democratic process so that we can benefit from both. That is what we are looking for. Second is that many countries see BRI as strategic, but small countries, I don't know intentionally or unintentionally, they see it as economic. For Nepal, BRI is purely economic. For Sri Lanka, BRI is purely economic. Similarly, China sees Indo-Pacific strategy as purely strategic, but Nepal sees Indo-Pacific as economic. Sri Lanka sees Indo-Pacific as economic because I don't know intentional or unintentional. So this is what we want to say that, you know, uh, these countries, they benefit from that. That's why they want to pretend. So at the same time, the country, small countries, we believe that we don't have that capacity to get caught into this big power game. We can't sustain I mean, where do Nepal stand between China and uh, US geopolitical war? Where do Sri Lanka stand? Where do Maldives stand? So we want to escape out of that process. Even if it is strategic, we believe that it is not a strategic and they want, we want to engage because we need economic assistance. So this is where the waste can come. If you want to keep China out, you have to first serve the first interest that is economic. If America do not come with build back better world and then you ask, oh, don't go for BRI, it's death trap. It's less convincing to the people because we as experts understand that. Common people, for common people, Hamman Tota is a port. For com common people in Nepal, uh, BRI is railway coming from China. So it's a development project. So I think that is where the institutions of the West has to come. Maybe they can come together and come with comprehensive South Asia plan where India, US, Japan, European Union can come together and address the first interest, which is economic, and then the other thing should be addressed. Yeah, no, Pramod, that's a really interesting point when you say, you know, that for a small country, something like a BRI is, is you look at it from the economic point of view and not at the strategic point of view. And this is my question to all of you, which, which came to mind when you said this, is that be that as it may, um, it is it is not possible for any of these countries, for a Nepal, for a Bangladesh, for a Sri Lanka, for a Maldives to, es uh, to escape the strategic ramifications of a BRI, right? I mean, you may look at it as economic and that perfectly makes perfect sense, right? But then, then what do you do about the strategic ramifications? How do you manage that? Uh, Rashida, do you want to do you want to come in on that? Um, I don't think uh, the Maldives thinks uh, too seriously about the BRI um, because I don't think Maldives is that involved or, with China or on that project. Of course, we have signed an MOU with China, which involves um, working with a BRI as well. But um, since it it hasn't outlined, China hasn't outlined what's involved with the BRI project in connection with the Maldives. Uh, Maldivian government has not thought, as far as I can see, has not thought about it very seriously. But I'm sure they are aware that it's, it's strategic as well. It's not just financial. But um, to what extent? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't see any signs that it's seriously thought of. Masrur, I will come to you with a very interesting question. But before that, Pramod, if I can come back to you, because you, you started this this uh, this point, and I'm really curious, you know, uh, how does how does a country like Nepal deal with the strategic fallout of a project that they claim is economic, but ha does have strategic dimensions? Uh, the, like Nepal signed MOU on BRI. It's almost three years, but there is no progress. 
all the speakers, uh, everyone in Nepal say BRI is good for the country. There is no progress on any report. None of the political parties say that BRI is not a wonderful project. Everyone says it's a wonderful project. Everyone said we should engage with China, but there is no progress. That is the implication that because of that, the small countries are caught in that and they're not, over to, they're not able to overcome that. Because of strategy implications, every country might have signed BRI project with China, but there's not progress or it's halted or it's, so because of that geopolitical competition the countries small countries are affected though they have signed it they're not able to benefit the way they want it uh, so far okay okay uh Masrur, there's a question which says that you know china is an opec society in every way government media scholarship etc how do these countries assess ground realities and motives vis-a-vis -vis their own country's interests and I'm coming to you about this because in Bangladesh, we have seen multiple instances where projects have started and then uh, the Bangladeshi government has come in and said, you know, there have been allegations of bribery in some cases. There have been allegations that uh, rules of procedure have not been followed. Very recently, we have seen cost escalation accusations and projects being uh, pushed down or, or, you know, put on the back burner. Uh, so, so is, how does how does a country operate with um, a system that is opaque and be sure that its end of the deal, its end of the bargain, will be kept up? Yeah, very good question, uh, Deep, and something <laughs> which is becoming uh, increasingly uh, common or pertinent. Uh, and I think this has links to your one of your earlier questions as well. Uh, ramifications of uh, the Belt Road or, or engagement in the Belt Road, right? I mean, uh, if I start with the ramification, if I to take the liberty to touch upon that one, because it has links to, uh, you know, the, the answer to your uh, latest question. Uh, the ramifications of joining BRI, taking advantage of BRI could be from different perspective. I think, uh, obviously, a lot of it is strategic security geopolitical uh but i think a lot is actually on uh you know governance uh and particularly project governance or project led governance you know within uh, in in terms of how uh development projects take place how public expenditure take place how annual development programs of the government take place and that's where i think uh, uh reliance on china I think certainly is laying bare uh, this particular problem, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, intensely, uh, where I think cost escalation, for example, is becoming a uh, regular phenomena, uh, you know, changes in uh, or, or sort of having to change scope or uh, expand the scope or budget is actually becoming more common phenomena. But despite that, the I do see, uh, I mean, I work very closely with the government of Bangladesh, the private sector, and, and some of the uh, foreign investors and, and foreign governments trying to pursue economic interest in Bangladesh. And I, I do work none other than the American companies or their platforms in Bangladesh. They're my clients, the American Chamber. Uh, and one area they're trying to sort of, uh, you know, compete, uh, you know, intensely with the Chinese is the infrastructure projects. But... Uh, without really uh, a plan and some of your recommendations and findings did have that you know where the economic levers uh, that China use have not been used as strong by let's say either the Americans or the Japanese or perhaps Indians as well uh, the debt trap is actually not yet a debt trap for uh, many many of the countries and and so on and and uh, you know uh, and, and then ch how China responds on a need base. So this need-based response uh, of China and the very timely availability as well as availability uh, in terms of the right size is still uh, putting China in a more advantageous position uh, with respect to countries like Bangladesh when it comes to projects, development projects, public projects or public sector projects being awarded uh, to Chinese companies and overshadowing the disadvantage till today uh, that arises from this uh, uh, cost escalation and project governance related issues, right? Uh, so, so I think it's it's really I think uh, it's almost like that you know the countries are ready to pay a little extra even if they're not uh, if it doesn't come as part of a plan, as long as they actually get 
what they need in time and in right size and without much conditionalities. And I think that's where China is ahead uh, compared to others. That's number one. Number two, uh, uh, the, you know, the, this opaqueness uh, of China uh, or the Chinese way of doing business, it is getting exacerbated by the weaknesses in the you know, host country's own governance system. So irrespective of who, which country the bidders or the project implementers come from, there is an inherent weakness, governance weakness, in the procurement system, public procurement system, project management system of country, public project management system in the countries like Bangladesh. So until unless those inherent uh, capacity, the problems are addressed, uh, which are sort of general, it's not specific to any country yeah. and it's built into the system, I think uh, this opaqueness in Chinese system is just uh, going to add a little extra because it would happen anyway, uh, you know, in most of the projects. And I think any opaque system that comes in from a foreign source can take greater advantage of that. So I think your report does have a recommendation where it uh, advocates for building capacity and local institutions, right? And this is one area where I think uh, local capacity and institution building or institution strengthening is, is critical. Uh, but that said, I think uh, you, your uh, findings also have a very good uh, sort of uh, point where the China is yet to understand the local institution and organization cultures better. They do, I think, understand the political institutions and the culture very well. They are starting to understand the, you know, the procurement related uh, culture practices, political economy of the government, government institution, but they still, uh, of course, do not understand the institution in general or broader institution as good as some of the other countries. Right, great. Uh, we are absolutely out of time, but before I go, I would, I would, uh, with your permission, ask a question and uh, hope for uh, some inputs from from all of you, which is largely on the angle. When we, when we were speaking to stakeholders in these various countries, something that did come up is that despite there not being formal mechanisms of exchanging information and understanding and knowledge about dealings with China between each other, that is something that was happening at an informal level. I was wondering if you would like to come in and, and, and talk about uh, the lessons for your respective countries that you see having been picked up from how other countries in the region have dealt with China. Asanga, I'll start with you. Um, definitely. Um, I mean, MCC uh, is, a, is a place where I can start the US MCC ground where I have spoken uh, with Pramod um, a few weeks ago, the importance of, uh, you know, going ahead with the MCC in countries like uh, Nepal. What happened to Sri Lankan case was uh, a commission was put up and then uh, we lost that uh, grant and uh, a heavy politicization, uh, seeing it as a national security threat. Now, this is the area that, uh, you know, a country should not, uh, you know, push uh, towards. Uh, there's a danger of doing that. And, um, I mean, China, uh, basically, it's uh, seeing its uh, assertiveness uh, in the region as well as its, uh, you know, the, the strategic trap, which I have been discussing about, of the, the long-term implications of the projects. Uh, one has to be, ex I mean, the countries have to be extremely careful on uh, this a particular area. What Mazur spoke about was very important on the transparency as well as, you know, bringing in uh, understanding the opaqueness. But if the projects are transformative, then it's fine. But the pro problem with Sri Lanka is that 99 years long-term leases, uh, even the next administration will not be able to undo certain things that this administration mm -hmm. has done uh, or the administration after that. Because when I did ask uh, from the Chinese side on the uh, on the projects uh, which were signed for 99 years, can we revisit? Uh, it was a clear answer. You cannot revisit because it has been signed. Um, so these are the dangers, I think, um, that the country should understand. What we can share uh, among our countries is like what we have gone through. And uh, the Sri Lankan, the debt trap which you have uh, captured, uh, the, not not limiting to the uh, quantitative data that Chinese have uh, less amount of money, Chinese have less uh, ships arriving to Sri Lanka uh, than the Japanese or than the others. No, no, those are not, uh, I mean, those are not, I mean, the quantitative data is one side, but you have to see the strategic dimension 
uh, I think we can share these among countries and, uh, you know, uh, build our standards uh, when it comes to bringing in the BRI, uh, for example, projects such as Matal, which has no, no flights coming in. There's an airport built in Sri Lanka. Um, then the business models are not working. So we need collaborative approaches uh, and also advice to the policymakers how best we can get it because in the, the, the money has already been put. Mm-hmm. It's been built. So how do we get it right, uh, Deep? Now, that, that's the most important thing because we, what do we do with this airport? How do we bring the flights in? So uh, I think the collaborative approach is really, really important. Rather than going into uh, you know, the, the projects that does not deliver any return, uh, Sri Lanka cannot afford to get, get into uh, projects uh, like this. And China should also understand, I'm very happy that China is looking at a consultative point of view, uh, looking at bringing BRI. How do we improve the BRI? And uh, one of the consultations I did recently uh, with China uh, was on how do we improve the standards of BRI? How do we get it? I mean, China is listening now. Uh, as well as trying to improve their model also, so which is really good. And so you have, uh, rather than confronting or, you know, so you're getting to a cooperation. So, um, I mean, your, your report uh, speaks uh, about uh, many recommendations on that uh, area. Uh, Masroor, uh, what is Bangladesh learning from others in the region? Uh, I think uh, there are several, uh, I think, but the most important is, you know, how do you really uh, balance uh, between uh, great partners, uh, some of whom actually are unfortunately on the different sides of the of a table or different sides of the camp. And I think uh, the Sri Lanka, Sanja mentioned a few good examples. I think uh, the turn of events in Sri Lanka or the developments, I think the, it's been closely followed in Bangladesh, both in the government, political quarter, or among the informed part of the mm. public is that because in the India, you know, China is extremely important infrastructure development partner, uh, supply chain partner, India and Bangladesh has, uh, you know, very deep rooted relationship right through the war of liberation. And it's the neighbor who has, uh, you know, very uh, multifaceted relationship with Bangladesh. And of course, Bangladesh does have a very uh, congenial relationship with the US. So how do you really balance it? And the latest example, I I was in a meeting with the health minister today, and I think the issue of vaccine diplomacy came up, or the vaccine complexities came up, whereby you know Bangladesh was offered Chinese vaccines back in October last year. And for different reasons, Bangladesh had to balance and could not go for the Chinese vaccine, which set back, according to the policymakers, uh, which set back Bangladesh's overall vaccination program by four to five months. And of course, what Bangladesh now has is overwhelmingly 90% since last uh, April or May is, is really Chinese vaccine. So, I mean, but Bangladesh had to make a balance, but in the process, it lost out a few months on an important initiative that's as uh, as as vaccine, COVID vaccination. So Bangladesh will have to, you know, uh, continually monitor this and play this balancing act even uh, more carefully. But when it comes to the interest of the nation and the and the country, I think Bangladesh probably will need to make more assertive decisions. Uh, and uh, I think this, uh, that's that I would say is the biggest learning that Bangladesh is going through uh, at the moment. Okay. Uh, Rashida and then Pramod. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, basically, um, two things the Maldives learned from uh, the region. Uh, one is the um, case of Hambantota in Sri Lanka. Um, <laughs> everyone uh, knows about that project, and it's not to get into, a, not to be involved uh, in a um, in a project like that, and then not to be involved with uh, with. with the dead trap and the other one is Sri um, sorry Pakistan economic corridor Pakistan uh, although it's we are not rep- they're not represented here um, and Djibouti over in Africa not to get 
not to lease the islands, in the case of Maldives, it will be islands, um, to China so that they could be turned into military uh, ports or military bases. Okay. Thank you. Finally, Pramod, quick short answer. We are way over time. Sure. I mean, like uh, Rashida said, like uh, from Hamad to Tawasti, like Nepal do not want to take huge projects uh, and because we don't want to be loan from China, only grants are welcome. Uh, similarly, we are very careful about environmental concerns being a Himalayan country. Uh, at the same time, we do not allow any of the players that can hurt either of the neighbors. We don't want Chinese players that can hurt India or the neighbors. We are very careful with neighbor sensitivity. Let me briefly point out the one question that is raised about MCC and I'll end there. On MCC, like uh, Nepal had welcomed that. Only when uh, the American official David Rand, he said that MCC is part of Indo-Pacific, it got into controversy. And there are media reports that China was not very happy with because China don't like obviously Indo-Pacific strategy and it was not happy with Nepal getting MCC. Uh, so there are reports. Uh, but recently, a few weeks ago, the government of Nepal, the prime minister said that they will be passing MCC, which is a good news. Uh, I think Chinese are also not very uncomfortable with MCC. The reason is that they know that if they are able to stop MCC, almost all the major Chinese products will also be stopped. So yeah. they do not want to have that uh, competition here that, okay, we will stop the American project and then American will stop our project. So I think they are comfortable yeah. with American and Nepalese projects here in Nepal. Thank you. I mean, Okay, thank you so much, uh, Asanga, Masroor, uh, Rashida and Pramod for joining us. And thank you to everyone who's been patiently uh, sitting with us, listening to us talk. Uh, do uh, take a look at the report at the Carnegie uh, Endowment website. Uh, the uh, Sinhala report, I'm, I'm told, is also available right now. So Asanga, you and everyone uh, who wants to take a look at that, please do. The Nepali and Bangla reports are going to be available on Friday. Uh, do do uh, take a look at the reports in English or in any of the regional languages. Thank you so much for, for uh, being with us this evening. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.